Another way to remember the grand scope of the book of Revelation is that the church at the beginning of the book of Revelation is on earth, persecuted, struggling, uh, seeking victory, and the church at the end of the book of Revelation is in heaven, victorious. And so between the two, we have uh, all the things that happen. Uh, depending on how you look at the book, some think that the book is talking about the church age, uh, all uh, that we've experienced as a church since Jesus went back to heaven. Others believe that it's pri fo focused primarily on the end of the age, and that's the way that I, I look at it and take it. There are a lot of these things that happen throughout the church age. The church has been persecuted throughout the church age. Persecution was happening when John was receiving these visions back in the end of the first century. But there seems uh, to be an intensification of the persecution toward the end of the age that is expressed not only in the book of Revelation, but in what is called the little apocalypse by Jesus in Matthew 24, which we are soon, God willing, to get, going to get to. So it'll be fun when we're looking at Matthew 24 on Sunday mornings and the book of Revelation uh, on Sunday night, unless we somehow or another get through the entire book of Revelation uh, by that time, though I doubt it. All right, so here we are. We're in the midst of the trumpets. We've had the first four trumpets rapidly uh, went by and, and spoke of ca uh, catastrophic events on earth. The fifth and sixth trumpets were some of the most bizarre materials, I said, in all the Bible. They are uh, descriptions of the release of evil into the world from the abyss. Uh, the first, uh, the sixth trumpet, or the fifth trumpet being these strange locust-like creatures. Uh, and then after that, some, uh, some soldiers with uh, some kind of strange uh, descriptions there. So we've, we're past all of that. We talked about all of that. And then in chapter 10, there's a, a little bit of a break here. Uh, John says, and I saw another angel... Uh, a mighty angel coming down from heaven dressed in a cloud and the um, rainbow on his head and his face as the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. And having in his hand a little book sitting open or lying open. And he placed his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth and he cried out in a loud voice as a lion roars. And when he cried out, the seven thunders spoke their voice. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders spoke and do not write them. Okay, so let's stop and talk about these Four verses. What strikes you about this angel in the first couple of verses, the description of this angel? He had a rainbow over his head, and so far the only person with a rainbow over his head has been, actually it was God, the one sitting on the throne in Revelation chapter 4. Uh, but what about these other descriptions, the cloud, the legs like pillars of fire? Yes, Jamie? In a cloud, all right? So the, the cloud always makes us stop and think about God and Jesus uh, because the clouds usually speak of God moving around in his, his creation. Uh, what else? What do you think about this, this angel? Here's the question. Is this angel Jesus or not? Uh, and there's been a lot of ink spilled about that with commentators. Um, what, would, what would be, uh, if we were going to argue that it is Jesus, what would we point out? Okay. All right, he has the open book in his hands, and back in chapter 5, he was the only one who could take the book out of the hands of God, which had seven seals on it, and begin to open it. Uh, that's another question, uh, Jackie, is whether or not this is the same book as the one in chapter 5. But let's stick with the question about whether or not this is Jesus for just a moment. If we're going to argue that it is Jesus, what else would we bring up, Kathleen? Chapter 1. It sounds a lot like the description of him in chapter 1. The face like the sun uh, and so forth. Okay. Yes, Jordan? Okay. 
Okay, so some of those same descriptions are used. Uh, anything else? Okay, yeah, we, we get something good for a change because chapter 9 was pretty tough. Yeah, it really, really was. What about one foot on the sea and one foot on the earth or the land? What is that telling us? Okay, sovereignty. He has authority over the land and, and the sea and all that are in them. Um, a, a lot of people don't believe, though, that this is Jesus. If we were going to argue that it's not, what would we point out? He is called an angel. That's a big one to get past because Jesus is never referred to as an angelos. Um, he is the lamb in, uh, in the book of Revelation. Uh, what else might we point out? He would, yeah. Uh, John would make it clear that this is Jesus and he doesn't seem to. You know, he's just vague enough that there can be some good arguments uh, about this, and both sides can, uh, can make their points. Kathleen? Okay, yeah, Kathleen's pointing out, well, uh, how, is this the second coming of Jesus, if he's coming to earth? How does that fit in? Uh, that's a good question. Of course, this is... Uh, then somebody would say, Kathleen, well, these, these aren't necessarily um, the, uh, the things that would happen in history. They're the visions that John saw. And it raises the question of what's the relationship between the visions that John saw and the things that actually happen in history. Uh, and this could be, since this is an angel coming down to earth to uh, give him this book, it could be entirely a visionary experience that doesn't have any visible uh, corresponding uh, activity in history itself. Jordan? Okay. Absolutely. So uh, what I've concluded provisionally, and, and I'm open-minded, but I, I don't think this is Jesus. I think this really is an angel. And the reason that he looks a lot like Jesus is what? He's reflecting Jesus. Very good, Chris. We all want to be like Jesus. You know, even the angels uh, want to be like Jesus. And this, this is an angel who apparently is a lot like Jesus. He reflects Jesus in a lot of ways. And, uh, and so he may even be some kind of special angel who, re uh, who represents Jesus in a special way. Kind of like the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. Uh, the angel of the Lord is another fruitful uh, discussion because it's really hard to tell sometimes, is that God or is it an angel who is speaking for God? Uh, and you can make a good case either way. It's, it just seems vague sometimes the way it's presented. We seem to have stepped into the same type of territory here uh, where it's really uh, kind of hard to uh, say absolutely for certain. But I believe that this is an angel that represents Jesus, that it's not Jesus himself. Uh, but he demonstrates that he has great power, he has sovereignty, uh, that he represents the, power, the presence of God, and he's a reminder that God is getting, does a lot of things through these angelic beings, uh, that a lot that God does in history uh, is, uh, is carried out through these beings that we call angels, who are for the most part invisible to us, although at times they become visible. Uh, and in this visionary experience, of course, he sees them quite often. So he cries out uh, like a lion. There's another thing that makes him like Jesus. And when he does, there's these seven thunders. Now, the seven thunders, on the face of it, would make us immediately stop and think about what? Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. Looks like here's just another one of our sevens. And um, the book of Revelation is not really filled with the number three much. I'll tell you who likes the number three is Matthew. Uh, a lot of the literary structure in Matthew's gospel is built on uh, triads, triplets, threes. 
Now, knowing that, you could go back and begin to study the book of Matthew and you, uh, you start to see where he likes to use in his outlines and things, threes. The book of Revelation is not necessarily known for threes. It's most known for what? Sevens. Uh, but there's, uh, and factors of seven. But there are fours also in the book of Revelation. Remember the four angels at the four corners of the earth who were holding back the wind? Uh, so four is also uh, kind of a, a number of completion. There's the four living beings who are around uh, the throne of God uh, in heaven. And so if we have uh, seven trumpets, and, or seven seals, trumpets, bowls, and thunders, suddenly we have what? We have four sevens, which would seem to be kind of a complete thing. When we take one out and we're just left with the three, there's really a sense that it's incomplete. Something is missing. So John, we kind of get the picture here. Notice John says when he hears the seven thunders and what they said, he did what? He got busy to, and he's, oh, I need to write that down. You know, just like I've written down the seven seals and the, uh, uh, and the six trumpets that I've had so far, uh, so I need to write this down too. But he's told, no, uh, to seal up what the seven thunders said. And this drives me crazy. Because I don't know about you, but I want to know what the seven thunders said. And you see, if I had been alive back then, I don't know what happened to John after this. I don't know if John was released and got to go back uh, to the churches and deliver the book of Revelation by hand or if he had to send it by a messenger. But I tell you what, if John had shown up in Ephesus and I was going to church in Ephesus and he read the book of Revelation, I would have been right there after the service was over. First in line, tell me what the seven thunders said, you know. Uh, I don't care that God said don't write them down. You can tell me because I want to know, you know. I I'm curious because God's leaving something out here. Why is he doing that? What's that? To, well, he's done that. He's done that. Yeah, I, don't, I don't need to know. I, apparently not, Chris, but that still bothers me. I may not need to know, but I what? I want to know. Yeah, would it make a difference in our understanding of this apocalypse of John if we were to know what the seven thunders said? It might. That was a good answer. Who said that? Lisa? That was a very careful And Did you notice how careful that answer was? It might. It might. Uh, because since we don't know what the seven thunders said, it might not. But I'm thinking that it would. Uh, John thought they were important enough to write down. And he was told, no, no seal it up. Uh, now, this, there's a contrast here between the seven thunders, which are sealed up, and what? The little book, which is what? It's opened. You know, the book of Revelation is a book of openings. John saw a door opened in heaven. Uh, the seals were opened. Uh, at one point, the temple is going to be opened. Uh, this word anoigo uh, occurs over and over again in the book of Revelation. And suddenly, to have something that's sealed up in the midst of all of these openings uh, and these unveilings is kind of maddening. Uh, why keep the, the seven thunders sealed up? Why even mention that they're there if you're not going to tell me what they are? Hmm. Very good. That's right. You know, you're you're reminding me of a question I have asked myself on more than one occasion. Would I want to know the moment of my death? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Would you want to know 
what the circumstances of your death and the moment of your death would be. Sabrina says, nah, nah. I don't think I would either. Uh, I think it'd be better if I, it just, when it comes, it comes. And I'll do my best until then. Karen? Let it sneak up on me? Yeah. Charles? Absolutely. Yeah, and I always think about Peter out by the lake when, uh, when Jesus called him. Remember they had the miraculous catch of fish and, and it began to dawn on Peter who Jesus was. And he, he said, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Go away from me. And, uh, and, and the Lord said, no, I'm going to make you into fishers of men. Come follow me. You know, that's all they needed to know at that point. It, it, what if Jesus had just unloaded? I was, oh, Peter, let, sit down for a minute. Let me tell you what's going to happen. You know, you're going to follow me for three years. Uh, and then we're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be crucified. You're going to deny me. Uh, and you're going to want to die because you love me so much by then, and then I'm going to... Re- you know, what, what would have happened if, if, if Jesus had unloaded all that on Peter? Uh, he would have been screaming, running away into the night. You know, we, we, just, we don't need to know all of that stuff. God feeds it to us um, as we can take it. But John got to know that's not fair. That is just not fair. Why should John know and I not know? Or if you don't think I'm important, you not know. You know, why should John not know and you not get to know? A um, couple of things here. Sometimes, and I, I had to learn this the hard way, sometimes God will reveal something to you, and it may even be about another person, but you don't need to do what? You don't need to tell them. You know, for whatever reason, God has revealed something to you about this other person. And when I was younger uh, and more foolish, notice I said more foolish, you know, um, I would think, oh, God's told me something. I've got to, uh, everybody's going to be so impressed that I heard from God. I've got to just run right out uh, and, and tell them about it. And it didn't work out the way I thought it was going to. Uh, and then I had to be reminded by God, I didn't tell you to go tell anybody that. You needed to know that, but you needed to keep it to yourself. When I tell you to tell, then you tell. So sometimes God reveals things to us simply because of the position that we happen to be in or or our circumstance or what we're going to be able to do in the future for that other person if it's about another person. And we really just need to sit on it and, and be quiet. And apparently John was mature enough to not write down what the seven thunders said and to never tell another soul what they said. Because had he told another soul, what probably would have happened? Now, there'd be a book out there now that we'd have to deal with, you know, the seven thunders. Uh, and we'd all be wondering about it. You know, who wrote the seven thunders and where'd they come from? Is, is, should that be in the Bible and all that, all that sort of thing? So uh, apparently John was uh, mature, uh, mature enough to know... Um, I'm not going to write this down. But the seven thunders are telling us a couple of other things about the book of Revelation that to me is key. It's a key to understanding the whole book. Uh, Or it's a key to our relationship with the whole book. Which would be what? Amen. Absolutely. These seven thunders are telling us right here, you don't know the whole story. So you better be what? You better be humble. Don't be walking around uh, cocksure that you figured out the book of Revelation because you don't know the seven thunders. And if you don't know the seven thunders, then you better be humble because you got a big piece missing. So I would say to you, anybody that claims to have the book of Revelation figured out, you run the other direction. Because God Himself said, don't write down the seven thunders. Let's keep them humble. Learn what you can and re- recognize and realize, I don't have it all. Now, uh, will the seven thunders be revealed at some point? I, I believe, it doesn't say absolutely they will. What's that big smile on your face back there, Jennifer? Okay. She looked like a Cheshire cat back there or something. This was just making her real happy. I don't know.
Will the seven thunders be revealed at some point? Well, the text doesn't say absolutely one way or the other, but I believe they will. Uh, I believe that as we get closer and closer to the book of Revelation, uh, a lot of things are going to get clearer. Uh, and a lot of interpretations from the past are going to look silly. Uh, and, and the book of Revelation is a test, in many ways, of our maturity as interpreters of the Word of God. The book of Revelation, listen to this, the book of Revelation is a test of our maturity as interpreters of the Word of God. Can we be humble enough to say, I don't what? I don't know. I don't, it used to bother me when I was, uh, especially first started doing street evangelism on Fry Street in Denton, Texas, next to the University of North Texas on Saturday nights and would go out. Of course, you, a bunch of college students, a lot of them are philosophy majors and so forth, and they've got the whole world figured out. They like to use uh, words like existential all the time. And uh, here comes the Christian going to talk to him about Jesus so uh, you know, I was the target. Uh, I, I was and everyone else with me. They were going to prove me wrong and make me look foolish. And I, I hated, you know, I, I was going to beat them, you know. Uh, I was smarter than they were. I knew everything. Well, I found out real quick what? I don't know everything. Uh, and I'm never going to. Uh, and I, I better learn how to do evangelism without having the answers to all the questions. And God showed me that, that I can. And so can you. I remember one night in particular... Uh, a guy came up to me, and he, and he heard what I was doing, so I was doing as a young guy, philosophy's major or something at UNT, and he said, well, have you ever heard of such and such? I don't remember now what it was, but I hadn't. And I was kind of getting to that point where I could swallow my pride a little bit and admit that I didn't know some things. <clears throat> and I looked at him, and I said, well, no, I, I haven't heard about that. Explain it to me. And he just took off on me. He said, you, you're out here trying to tell people about God and the universe and everything else, and you don't know about this thing, whatever it was, this new buzzword in, in the philo uh, philosophy department at UNT. And, uh, and he, just, he was just pounding on me, you know, and nice and loud so that a lot of other people around would, would hear, uh, gaining points with the crowd. And I listened to him, let him run down a little bit, and um, asked the Lord for something to say to him, because uh, I learned you can do that, you know. Have you learned that? You can just, don't worry about it, just ask God. What do I need to say here, God? Uh, and sometimes he'll give you some amazing things to say. So here's what I said to that, that young man that night. I said, you know what? If you came up to me and you asked me to describe to you the physiology of my father's um, kidney, I wouldn't even know where to start. I could not answer any of your questions about how my father's kidney functions. But I want to tell you something. I know my father exists, and I know he loves me. So if you want to go away and say that I, don't, I, I can't uh, talk about God because I can't answer some arcane question about something, that's, that's your business. Uh, but just know this, and I liked this part, you're wrong. You're wrong. So it's okay not to know everything, and it's okay not to know everything about the second coming of Jesus Christ, because as we get closer, things get clearer. There were things about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Well, let's face it, in the Old Testament, they, they wouldn't even have known what the second coming of Jesus Christ even meant. The what of who? Uh, if you'd have said the second coming of Jesus Christ to Malachi or Habakkuk or Isaiah or any of them, they would have said the what of who? What are you talking about? Does that mean that they didn't have good information about God? No, they had great information about God. They had everything they needed to know about God at the time that they lived. And they understood it. And they proclaimed it. And they were confident. But then Jesus came and things got clearer. Then Jesus went back to heaven and things got even clearer. Uh, and uh, now, as Jesus' second coming gets closer, things are going to get even, uh, even clearer. So this is where uh, we demonstrate our maturity especially those of you who are Sunday school teachers or teachers of the Word, those of you who are teaching the Word to your children, your grandchildren, uh, this is where we demonstrate our maturity in dealing with the Word of God, which is to know where to draw the line and say, we don't know that part yet. So let's not uh, make it up. Because if we start making it up, we're going to make up the wrong thing. Let's be willing to say, here's what the Word reveals. This is what we know, and we stand on that, 
the rest will wait and we'll get it. You know, the thunders will speak again uh, and, and we'll get them. Uh, and and that, that's hard sometimes when people are throwing all these, uh, these really nice sounding suppositions out there and everybody's got their itching ears and they want to listen to all of that. Uh, it's hard to say, well, really, the Bible doesn't answer that question. Uh, and where the Bible is silent, I will be what? Where the Bible is silent, I will be silent. And where the Bible speaks, I will speak. That's a great rule of thumb uh, for all of us who are teachers of the Word. Where the Bible is silent, I will be silent. And when the Bible speaks, I will speak. So the thunders teach us a couple of things, uh, several things actually, but one of the most important things is that even with the book of Revelation, we don't have all the information, so we've got to be humble in the way that we use the information that we do, uh, that we do have. All right, verse 5. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the earth, there's a repetition, so there's an emphasis uh, of the power of this angel, he raised his hand, his right hand, to heaven, and he swore by the one who lives into the ages of the ages. Just a reminder to you, your Bible says what? Lives what? Forever. But um, uh, remember, it, it's, it actually says into the ages of the ages. Nothing wrong with the word forever. It's accurate. I just don't think there's enough in there. Um, into the ages of the ages does mean forever but it implies that there's more, there's more diversity and color and interest to eternity. When you say forever, it's like, boom, shh. You know, uh, once we get started, uh, this is it. Uh, is, there any, is there any variation to it? But in the Bible, in the New Testament, when it says into the ages of the ages for forever, now we got the idea, well, this, this forever thing sounds kind of interesting. You know, there's lots of ages going on here. Uh, when one age ends and another one begins, uh, and we start over and do some new things. That, now, that sounds intriguing uh, to me, and we even have an indication of that within the book of Revelation. When we get to chapter 20, we have something that we'll have to talk about called the millennium, which is an age, apparently, of a thousand years, which is different from this age that we're in right now, and it's different from the age of the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. So here's this idea that there's these multiple ages that God is unfolding as we get closer to them uh, and each one has its own characteristics uh, each one of them is kind of like a fresh beginning so we sort of get to start over again in our understanding of God and of his plan and how he is un unfolding things so eternity sounds uh, to me much more fascinating with into the ages of the ages uh, instead of the simple word of uh, forever and it goes on he says who created the heaven and all the things that are in it, and the earth, and all the things that are in it, and the sea, and all the things that are in it. Now, that's a wonderful little hymn there. As we're going through the book of Revelation, we're picking up worship, uh, worship language. Here's some good worship language right here. Speaking of the sovereignty uh, of God, that God's message is for everyone because God uh, made everything. It belongs to Him. Uh, a good cycle of uh, worship is to begin worshiping God for his attributes. We looked at this in chapters 4 and 5, worship God for his attributes. Uh, remember the order that they came in in chapter 4? God is holy, he is all-powerful, and he is eternal. You know, what good is it uh, to be holy if you can't pull it off? Uh, if, but if you're all-powerful, then you can. Well, what good is it to be holy and all-powerful uh, if you're not going to be around tomorrow? But God is holy, he is all-powerful, and he is eternal. So he clears the floor right there. That's some good worship. Uh, right there. Then that we come along and we worship him because he's the creator. He made all things uh, and by his will all things were being and were created. We talked about that. Uh, God created everything in his mind in eternity past. What a mind. What a beautiful mind. You know, uh, I want to know the mind of Christ, the mind of God. And then uh, after creation, since creation fell, we worship God because he is redeemer. Uh, he is the uh, savior. He is the one who has rescued us uh, who has elevated us back to a position at the right hand uh, of God in Christ Jesus. And these are, these are good things. Uh, and so this angel gives us a little language here to use in worshiping God as creator. And then he makes a statement here at the end of verse 6 that has caused a little bit of uh, uproar. Um, and in the old King James Version, it said uh, that time will be 
no more. Time will be no more. Well, that captured my attention when I was younger. Wow. Wow. That just blew my mind. So in heaven, there's no time. Uh, what an amazing thought. Uh, but I've had, to, I've had to adjust my understanding of that uh, over the years uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, when I go and read Revelation chapters 21 and 22 about heaven, uh, I see some indications that maybe that's not the case. For instance, uh, the tree uh, of life is in heaven. Remember that? Some of you have read all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. The tree of life lines the river of life on either side of it. So it's not just one tree, apparently. It's a bunch of trees. Of course, there's going to be a lot of folks there, so we need a lot of trees, right? A lot of trees of life. And it says, who knows, remembers, the tree of life bears fruit. What? Every month. Well, how can it bear fruit every month if there's no time in heaven? That seems to be a time indicator. And there's some other ones that we'll look at when we get there. So that kind of had me scratching my head. Then I come back to this text here, uh, and I realize that all of our new translations, and I mean all of them, uh, have rendered that a little bit differently. What do they say? There'll be no more delay. Now, they haven't changed the underlying text. The underlying text is still the same. Chronos, ukete, este. Uh, time no longer will be. But the word chronos uh, in the Greek language can also be used as a specific time, not as time in general. Um, in, in other words, this isn't saying necessarily that there's no more time. It's just saying that there's... Uh, uh, that we don't have time for this particular issue. I ain't got time for that. Okay? I ain't got time for that. Not ain't got time, but ain't got time for that. Uh, it, and uh, it, it's a specific application. Don't laugh at me, Tommy. It, it's a specific application uh, that's saying that in this particular instance, the time is almost up. That uh, what, God has, what God has promised that He's going to do it's about to happen. Time is, is almost up. Uh, now, if you, if you thought about this text the same way I did for a long time, then that's probably bothering you. You may even be mad at me right now. That's okay. You can come see me after this is over, and uh, I'll arm wrestle with you uh, a little bit over the text. But it, the newer, newer uh, translations are, are almost, uh, almost certainly right. That the idea here is that um, there will be no delay. Verse 7, but in the days... Uh, of the sound of the seventh angel, when he is about to blow his trumpet, then the mystery of God will be fulfilled. What's the mystery of God? Okay, it's planned for eternity, Kathleen. Okay. Um, actually, the, it says here that it's already been revealed as... Here's, here's where you'll get your money's worth to tonight also on this next word. As announced or preached, I think most of your English translations say, as announced or preached uh, through his servants, the prophets. <clears throat> so it, at least in this visionary experience, it's a mystery that's uh, been revealed already. What is the mystery of God? I, I want, when, when I'm through with you in the next couple of minutes, I want you to answer this question without even thinking. I want you to answer this question at 3 o'clock in the morning and somebody wakes you up and says, Ron, Ron, what's the mystery of God? I want you to answer this question. What is it? You know it. It's Jesus. Good start. Who threw Jesus out there? Thank you, Karen. That's my wife. I'm proud of her. Hey, we're in a Christian church. You can always throw Jesus out there and see what happens, you know. What's that, Jennifer? Jennifer? It has, salvation what? Okay, yeah, we're getting closer and closer. Salvation through Jesus. But the reason it was a mystery is because Jesus what? He died on a cross. And when people saw him dying, they didn't say, oh look, there's our Savior. They said what? Oh look, there's a man who's cursed by God. And if somebody would have said, no, 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 that's God's Savior. They would have said what? You're insane. 
What kind of foolishness are you talking about? What is the mystery of God? The mystery of God it is reconciling the world to Himself through the death of His Son, Jesus Christ. It's a mystery revealed. And it's a mystery that is considered foolishness to many. But to some, it is the message of salvation in Christ Jesus. So if anybody asks you, what is the mystery of God? You say the cross of Jesus Christ is the mystery of God. And it's a mystery that's been revealed. And what's happening in this book that we're reading is that Jesus' followers, particularly in the first century, but also those who live toward the end of the age and all who live between, are learning that the ironic salvation of God through Jesus Christ, which is an ironic victory. The reason I'm calling it an ironic victory is because it doesn't look like a victory. It looks like a defeat. And the irony of that victory of our Savior, Jesus Christ, is transferred to us. And that's why Paul said, when I'm weak, what? He is strong. That's the irony of being a Christ follower. is because in our weakness, we reflect the strength of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So, um, the mystery of God, which is the Lamb, um, has been preached, announced, there's nothing your English translator could have done about this. There's just, there's just no way to do this right. But here's the word, euangelizo. Uh, it's a verb, and it's related to the noun uh, euangelion, euangelion. And when euangelion makes its way to English, it becomes, guess what? Euangelion. It's eu, epsilon, upsilon means something good. In, in Greek, when you say, ooh, what was that commercial that um, they put the ooh in food? I don't have the voice for that. Somebody's, you're going to come up, you're going to remember that later. They put the ooh in food. But the you in uh, Greek was something good, something good. So this is something good. It's, uh, it's you, angelon, message, angelon, angel, messenger. This is a good message. It is a good Good news. Euangelizamo is to tell the good news. It's where we get our English word evangelism. Evangelism. All right? So what's really happening here, take a look at your English translation. Let's read verse 7 again. But in the days of the sound of the seventh angel, when he is about to blow his trumpet, then the mystery of God will be completed as he evangelized through his own servants, the prophets. That's not good English. There's no good way to do that. Unless they did something like this. Uh, uh, as he proclaimed as good news through his servants, the prophets. So uh, here is uh, just a reminder that um, the mystery of God is uh, it's Jesus Christ. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. The uh, evangelism, uh, the evangelistic message. All right, uh, verses 8, 9, 10, and 11 kind of have a different um, message to them. Uh, it's related to what we've just looked at, but uh, I'm going to make a call here and just stop because that was a lot. Uh, we got a lot done tonight in those verses. We'll come back and finish uh, this up next Sunday night, God willing. But let's re remember this. The book of Revelation is uh, it's a book that it's a book that challenges us as people of the word to learn how to be mature in dealing with God's word. And part of that is to recognize where the line is drawn. Remember what I said: where the word, when the Bible is silent, I will be silent. When the Bible speaks. I will speak. It's a good rule of thumb uh, to live by, especially as Bible teachers. And also, it reminds us that anyone who thinks that they've got the book of Revelation, the second coming, all figured out, if they pull all their charts out and they don't, there's nothing missing, then you can forget their charts because there is something missing. 
the seven thunders. Uh, and the seven thunders are there just to remind us, you don't have it all yet. Just sit tight, be mature, and be willing to wait and listen and see what God, see what God uh, reveals. Uh, so humility. Humility is a mark of, um, is a mark of maturity. And the book of Revelation will bring us to our knees. But it will bring us to our knees not only in humility, but in worship. We will worship the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, appreciate you being here tonight. Let's pray, we'll sing, we'll be dismissed, and see you again soon. Father in heaven, we thank you, God, for all that you've revealed to us. Our hearts yearn to know what we don't know yet, to hear what the seven thunders said, and, and other things that maybe we're not, we're not even smart enough to know that they're there. Uh, but we know that you have all of these things to reveal to us through the ages of the ages. We look forward to that. It sounds like a marvelous journey uh, to be on with you. We, we, uh, we thank you for including us in that. And we pray, God, that you would give us insight through your spirit, that you would illuminate your word, and that when your word speaks, that we would speak, and we would speak boldly. Thank you, Father, for my brothers and sisters here in this room tonight. Oh, God, as we embark on another week, I ask for a fresh filling of your spirit. I pray, God, that we could walk in your spirit, that we could be wise, uh, and that we would represent you well, and that when we come back together, that we would have testimonies about what it is that you're doing in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.